uh, take a five minute break, just let us know. Um, but in any case, uh, welcome everyone to our uh, Schubert seminar. Uh, today we have Juliana Tomasco from Smith College, who's going to talk about uh, which Hessenberg varieties are GCAM. All right, thank you. Um, so I've sort of taken, uh, I, I took you at your word about creating a talk that was accessible to graduate students, even a sort of wide range of graduate students. Um, so, so that's how we're gonna start. Um, and uh, here's the basic plan. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about what are Hessenberg varieties, what is the GKM approach, um, and really why are Hessenberg varieties? Uh, so then we're going to take a break uh, and uh, and come back and talk both about Taurus actions on Hessenberg varieties uh, and this sort of question, which uh, Hessenberg varieties are GKM, which at that point will be, uh, it will be natural to sort of uh, think about that question really as a partial list of which nilpotent Hessenberg varieties are GKM. Uh, so, let's see, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start. Um, I didn't. I didn't know Bill would be here today, so I. I feel like a postdoc again. Uh, so I'm going to start by uh, situating Hessenberg varieties um, and situating them very concretely. Uh, so they are subvarieties of the flag variety. Um, and for me, for today, uh, everything is in GLN. Um, so like everything that I draw will be in in uh, C3 actually. So a flag is you know, a line that contains the origin uh, that is contained in a plane that is contained in a three-dimensional space. Uh, I can think of it as a uh, vector uh, contained in, or a, a choice of a vector that spans the line um, that I then add another linearly independent vector to span the plane that I then add another linearly independent vector uh, to span the three-dimensional space. And of course, this is uh, well. So this is fully accurate, but somewhat inconvenient um, because it is uh, it, it leads to a lot of redundancy in uh, the choice of spanning vectors at each stage. Uh, so so motivated by this sort of desire to pick some unique representative, I would basically do Gaussian elimination. Um, and uh, so, like on the line, I would pick depending on your conventions, you can pick it different way, but I personally uh, would choose to rescale the line so that the lowest non-zero entry uh, is actually one. So in this case, uh, just dividing that vector by two, uh, then once I've done that, uh, once again, I have a lot of redundancy in my choice of the plane because uh, actually not only I mean, I really need to Gaussian eliminate. Not only can I rescale my second vector, um, but I really want to sort of eliminate uh, uh, the, the, all these sort of appearances of the uh, first vector in the second vector. Um, so subtract off uh, so that the lowest non-zero entry that I had in my first vector, so that entry is now zero. Uh, and then I would have, ooh, So I think if I just subtracted, if I have not done anything wrong, if I just subtracted, uh, I had have this uh, vector 0, 2, 2, and then I uh, rescale and get 0, 1, 1. And uh, so I keep doing this process uh, all the way through, uh, coming up with some sort of more unique-ish set of representatives uh, based on whatever sort of conventions I decided to pick at the outset in terms of which entry I'm going to normalize uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, so great. Um, so I can make this more concise just simply by stacking up uh, all of these vectors into one matrix um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, just sort of summarized the choosing good representatives for the flags, uh, partitions flags into Schubert cells. Uh, so for our purposes, uh, we will think about our Schubert cells as a permutation matrix with free entries above and to the left of the pivots um, and zero everywhere else. Um, and, uh, and if I wanted to sort of think more uh, intrinsically about what's happening, I am picking coset representatives for, uh, uh, for double cosets uh, of the um, general linear group. Uh, if I imagine taking double cosets with respect to the Borel subgroup 
of upper triangular matrices. Um, so the permutation matrix that shows up in the middle is the pivots of the entry when I'm doing uh, Gaussian elimination. Um, and it's always also just this sort of uh, index set of this double coset. So that's where Hessenberg varieties are. Um, so to think about what Hessenberg varieties are, I'm actually going to start with a um, thing that is not complete. I mean, it is a Hessenberg variety, but it is not all Hessenberg varieties. Um, so I want to just start by picking an n by n matrix. Um, and the thing in blue is the one that we're just going to start with. And we're going to ask the question, when does x preserve a flag? Uh, in the sense that x sends the ith part of the flag into the ith part of the flag for all i. Um, so the way for this entire talk, the way we're going to really approach this is the idea that we're going to test it on individual Schubert cells. Um, so in other words, we're going to take x, that's the matrix on the far left there, um, and uh, we're just going to multiply it against a Schubert cell. Uh, there's, there's a Schubert cell, the, the one that we were kind of identifying before. Um, and so I could do some matrix multiplication. I did the matrix multiplication ahead of time. There it is. Um, and what it means in this sense for uh, X to send the ith part of the flag into the ith part of the flag is the following, right? So I need this first vector. So this first vector 0, 1, A uh, should be a multiple of the first vector here. So that's x sends v1 into v1. Um, and then I need the second vector. So then I know that the first vector is contained in the span of the first vector um, in order to make it so that the span of the first two vectors is contained in the span of the first two vectors. I just need to add the condition that the second vector is in the span of these first two vectors here. So, uh, so you can think of this as a sequence of, uh, or uh, it's a sequence of just vector equations, uh, where I've got a particular vector I want to enter. It is in the span of one vector, another vector that I just test to see if it's in the span of two vectors, and so on and so forth. Um, so like, in this case, actually, we can furthermore, look at this first column and look at that orange vector uh, that I marked out. All right, so the, uh, the first column on the right-hand side there, 0, 1, A, is in fact not a multiple of, uh, of 1, A, B, uh, because the pivots are just like in the wrong place. Uh, so, so here, like, not true. Here, uh, that x vi is contained in vi. Um, in fact, it's a perfectly fine exercise uh, to uh, go through this process. I don't know. I sort of feel like if I had graduate students here, I would ask them to try to find me a Schubert cell um, uh, for which any part of the Schubert cell satisfies this condition that x vi is contained in vi. Um, it's a small calculation, right? Uh, so this particular variety that we're looking at is uh, called the Springer fiber. Some people would call it Springer growth and Deke fiber if you use, say, an arbitrary matrix X. Um, and like there's a quite literal sense in which uh, the line, uh, this, so the, the line of the Springer fiber when X, um, so the line of the Springer fiber is satisfying the condition that x v1 is contained in v1. Um, in other words, it is giving you an eigenvector of x. Uh, and the Springer fiber itself is on some level giving you this eigen flag of x. Uh, it's a fairly restrictive uh, condition, especially with the x, uh, the choice of x that we started with there. Um, but there's a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, both combinatorics um, and uh, interesting geometry of various sorts. I suppose if I have extra time, you could stop me and ask more about that. Um, but for now, I'd like to move on to saying what Hessenberg varieties are. And to start with, 
actually, I'm just going to go and give you exactly the same slide that we had before. Uh, but what I would like to do, I'm still going to pick this n by n matrix uh, x. Um, but instead of asking whether x preserves the flag, uh, sending vi to vi, I am going to actually broaden this condition. I'm going to say that x sends vi into vh of i, where so I still want it to satisfy these sort of flaggy uh, conditions. So h is going to be some function on the indices. Um, and I'm going to ask that h of i be both greater than or equal to h of i minus 1 and greater than or equal to i. Um, so that first condition is sort of like a non-decreasing condition. Uh, since my flags already have the property that uh, vi is contained in vi plus any dimension, um, I sort of really do want my function h of i to have a condition like that. That second condition, that h of i greater than or equal to i, well, we can see that we can revisit that in a moment or two, and we'll have to revisit it a little bit later on. Um, but that second condition is something that you really could get rid of, and some interesting things happen when you get rid of. Um, we're just not going to today. So then, if we do this, I'm going to pick a specific, a specific function. All right. So we're going to take. Uh, h of i equals i plus 1, and h of 3 equals 3. Uh, so, so we're going to test on this specific Schubert cell, this specific set of containment conditions. Um, so here, we're asking, does x send the i part of the flag into the i plus first part of the flag? Um, and let's just sort of go through what it's saying uh, for each of the vectors. Um, so on the right-hand side, we have x times the different spanning vectors for the flag. Uh, so what we want is for this first column to be in the span of the first two columns of the flag itself. And then we're going to want the second column to be in the span of the first three columns. All right, so I'm just going to sort of observe right now those purple three columns span all of C3. Uh, and in particular, I actually see the vector 001 uh, right in there. So that second condition is just sort of vacuously satisfied. Uh, what about the first condition? Is the vector 0, 1a contained in the span of those two orange vectors? Here I'm going to pause for a second. Then just let me pause actually and just sort of wait for any sort of comment here. Including to the very specific question of, is the vector 0, 1a in the span of those two column vectors circled in orange? So for me, looking at this sort of naively, 
just linear algebra -ly. I would check whether a vector like this is in the span of these two. Uh, first, by sort of noting that any multiple of the vector 1, A, B is going to produce some non-zero entry in the bottom row, which would not produce a zero in the bottom row on the left-hand side. Uh, so unless, unless I were actually taking a zero multiple of that first column, 1, A, B. And then, uh, then I would say, OK, 0, 1, A is in the span of 0, 1, C. Uh, if and only if a equals c. So on the one hand, I've like strictly relaxed the conditions from the Springer fiber. Um, I've like expanded uh, the number of flags that satisfy the condition, as well as the number of Schubert cells that are represented uh, in in the Hessenberg variety. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I've also got um, sort of visibly some uh, conditions on the entries uh, that can in general get quite complicated. So this sort of is our first answer of what is a Hessenberg variety. Uh, so they generalize Springer fibers. Um, they have the property that Schubert cells intersect Hessenberg varieties in these affine pieces. Um, so I've got a little asterisk there because there's some sensitivity to how you've chosen your basis relative to the linear operator x uh, for that claim to be true. But it is possible to choose your basis nicely enough um, so that the intersection of a Hessenberg variety and a Schubert cell is affine, like homeomorphic to c to the d for some d. Um, and furthermore, these affine pieces are going to form a paving by affines. Um, so. Uh, Topologically speaking, uh, it's like a CW complex in the sense that the uh, closures of these cells, these affine pieces, um, give you the cohomology or homology. Um, but uh, but the closures are more sensitive, and 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 in fact, they're like quite perfectly mysterious um, in most Springer fibers uh, and like almost all of the Hessenberg uh, varieties. Uh, so. Uh, Springer fibers. Uh, so Springer fibers were first developed um, as an example of a geometric representation. So their cohomology carries a natural action of the symmetric group Sn. Um, it's uh, quite beautiful. Uh, there's multiple different constructions. In fact, they're not all equivalent. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, sometimes you know, Springer's representation is used alternately to refer to a particular association of uh, Springer fibers with irreducible SN representations or the dual, uh, depending on exactly how you've constructed it. Um, and sort of consequently, there's a lot of interesting uh, combinatorics around the cells of Springer fibers and uh, standard Young tableau uh, and uh, inversions. Uh, and certain sort of limitations on inversions. Um, when you add Hessenberg conditions, uh, you are uh, sort of gaining some uh, systematic, the ability to systematically limit what kinds of inversions you look at, um, including getting sort of narrowing in on particular classes of um, inversions like descents, for instance. Um, and we'll say a little bit more, once I've said a little bit about what is GKM theory. So I think of GKM theory as sort of a computationally feasible way to construct cohomology combinatorially. Uh, a priori, I'm going to start with more data, but at the end of the day, I will have a module basis um, that is also a cohomology uh, basis. Um, and uh, I will have some sort of like fairly routine mechanism to go from the equivariant cohomology to the ordinary cohomology. It only works if you start with varieties that are relatively well behaved. This is usually the world in which I live. Um, and uh, part of a 
point of this talk is to sort of try to figure out which of the Hessenberg varieties um, are also in this world. So the basic setup is that we have some sort of torus that's acting on a variety well. I'm actually going to say very little about what well means, um, except to observe that it is true um, in the spaces that we're going to be looking at. Um, so, uh, so largely, if it acts well, um, then we can get a graph from one dimensional and zero dimensional p orbits. And moreover, we're going to get some sort of labels on the edges of this graph, uh, namely the weight uh, on these one dimensional t orbits. Um, so one of the details that I am not mentioning about with well is that uh, the torus will act nicely enough so that the one dimensional and zero dimensional orbits form a kind of nice combinatorial graph. Uh, Again, we're not really going to worry about anything that's not a perfectly good finite graph um, without crazy loops or multi edges or anything like that. So I'm going to elide all conditions and refer you to a different talk if you want to hear more about that. Um, so then the result, the GKM result, Kareski, Kotwitz, McPherson, is that if you've got this nice setup, then the equivariant cohomology can be described as. Uh, a way of labeling the vertices of this graph with polynomials, so one polynomial for each vertex, satisfying the condition that uh, any two adjacent polynomials need to be a multiple on the label on that edge. So back to flags for a second. Uh, so here, and really for the rest of the talk, when I think of my torus, I think of diagonal matrices. Um, so we could just sort of like inspect what are the weights and zero and one dimensional orbits uh, in the flag variety. Uh, so like, so to do this, I'm actually just gonna multiply matrices. Uh, Uh, so I think that I'm multiplying this correctly, and I'm going to count on my esteemed audience members um, to correct me if I'm not. Uh, so I just multiplied, uh, and the issue, as I see it, is that this matrix on the right is not in my preferred form. Uh, on the other hand, I can do some Gaussian elimination, um, so rescaling uh, columns which is to say multiplying on the right by something, and uh, it just normalize those bottom non-zero entries. Uh, so if I do that, I end up with something that looks like one, and then I have to divide this first column by T3, uh, divide the second column by T2, and then divide the third column by T1. All right, so now, uh, so now I have a matrix that is back in the cell in which I started. Uh, so these weights, uh, so the weights are coming from this, the, the, the way that the torus is acting um, within each cell. Um, and I'm usually going to linearize them as uh, Ti minus Tj, especially when I'm thinking about uh, GKM theory, I'm going to use the same variables uh, and just uh, look at context to figure out whether I am looking at one of the uh, linearized weights or um, thinking about the actual group action. Uh, so in terms of identifying the zero dimensional orbits, it really doesn't matter. Uh, sort of, um, in this case, you can sort of like visibly see when I'm sitting inside of a Schubert cell, if I have any, uh, any torus whatsoever, then I am going to be uh, moving around somewhere inside that Schubert cell, um, which is to say the zero dimensional orbits have to have A, B, and C all equal to zero. Otherwise, I am being moved. Uh, so it's just going to be the permutation matrices. Uh, the one dimensional orbits, well, if I have uh, more than one of those non-permutation entries non-zero, then, uh, then again, I will be moving around in different parts of the Schubert cell. Uh, so the one-dimensional orbits uh, only have one non-zero entry. 
So other than the permutation. Uh, and uh, so consequently, we're sort of like seeing the one dimensional orbits, uh, seeing the zero dimensional orbits. And on each one dimensional orbit, we can actually just like concretely multiply and identify the weight. So, uh, so what is the flag? Uh, sorry, what is the graph? Um, so the graph is going to have vertices uh, that uh, correspond to the zero dimensional orbits. Uh, the edges are the one dimensional orbits. Uh, we, we can see in this example up here that, uh, that if I take any one dimensional orbit um, and then sort of uh, so I, can, I, can, I can sort of use my torus to shrink the variable A say and make it as close to zero as I want. So I can see there's one permutation flag uh, in the closure of that one dimensional orbit. Um, conversely, if I sort of use my torus to push the entry A really close to infinity, you can see it's uh, sort of having the effect of making the line look very, very much like the vector zero, one, zero. And the plane remains the same span of two vectors that it was span of two permutation vectors uh, that it was to begin with. So I, uh, that's a hand wavy way of saying um, that these edges are going to be connecting uh, two permutation flags that differ by a um, exchanging two of the columns. Um, and then finally, the, the label. Uh, so the label is going to be Ti minus Tj, where i and j are the two columns that were exchanged. So we can just draw this. And I'm going to write things out. Uh, just conflating permutations uh, using uh, using simple transpositions um, to uh, concisely describe my permutation matrices, um, and just sort of conflating the matrix with the permutation itself. So. Here are my uh, so here are my uh, permutations, and I'm going to draw these red edges. So these red edges are labeled by T1 minus T2. Uh, if you go across a red edge, so left multiplication by S1 will take you. Um, from one endpoint to the other endpoint along a red edge. We'll have blue edges to indicate T2 minus T3. So left multiplication by S2 takes you across those blue edges. Um, and I'll create some green edges. So green are T1 minus T3. Uh, so this is sort of left multiplication by the uh, transposition that exchanges one and three, or the permutation S1, S2, S1 uh, will take you across those green edges. Um, so, great. Let me just take this graph for a second, move it down here. All right, so I'm going to, uh, so so uh, if we are using GKM3 to create the equivariant cohomology, um, I am looking for all possible ways of solving a sort of system of modular equations in polynomials. Uh, and uh, I'll just label some of these vertices um, uh, in a way that satisfies the orange condition. Whenever I go across an edge, the uh, polynomials on either side should be a multiple of Ti minus Tj. So T1 minus T2 across the red ones, T2 minus T3 across the blue, T1 minus T3 across the green. Uh, so let's see, I'll take this one. 
Uh, so I'm going to put zero on these two vertices. Uh, I'll put T1 minus T2 over here. Uh, so that bottom red edge, I know I need to be a multiple of T1 minus T2 on the top of it. Um, and so T1 minus T2 will work. Um, so if I keep going up, so this second vertex on the left um, is also above zero across a red edge. So it needs to be some multiple of T1 minus T2. Um, and in fact, T1 minus T2 works. It also satisfies the condition of the leftmost green edge. Uh, moving up on the right-hand side, the vertex S2, S1, uh, requires us to put some multiple of T1 minus T3 in order to um, uh, in order to satisfy the condition that uh, that you can put zero uh, right below it over a green edge. Um, and now, if you look at this edge, this blue edge right here, uh, the difference between the endpoints here is uh, T2 minus T3, uh, which is in fact a multiple of that blue edge. Um, so similarly. I can put T1 minus T3 up at the top, uh, and all of my GKM conditions are satisfied. This is, in fact, a GKM class. And in fact, it corresponds to a Schubert class. Um, there's uh, cool things uh, connected to this graph, um, which is to say that, like, actually, I did not have any choice at all um, when I sort of first decided to put T1 minus T2 at the bottom uh, at, at, at S1. Um, and zeros uh, below it. If I once I set those three uh, values into place, and if I require that I am just going to put a homogeneous degree one polynomial everywhere, um, then this is like the only way to solve this. Um, uh, so I could say more, but I will not. Um, I yeah, I could say more, but I will not. Um, so, so, so we can like just from GKM theory. Once you have an adequate torus section, you can get this sort of beautiful combinatorial construction of all of the uh, uh, of like just the whole equivariant cohomology. So back to this question: Why study Hessenberg varieties? Um, so there's a sort of well-known result that if X is regular semi-simple, so diagonal with distinct values along the diagonal. The Hessenberg varieties are GKM. Um, both the equivariant cohomology and the ordinary cohomology have these like beautiful SN actions uh, that it inherits really from sitting inside the flag variety. Um, this representation shows up in combinatorics in sort of multiple ways in an uh, active and evolving theory, as uh, Shureshi and Locke's uh, quasi symmetric uh, chromatic polynomial, um, and uh, related to both the Stanley Stembridge conjecture. Uh, and LLP polynomials, which in a sort of loose sense are like dual to uh, what you're gonna see me construct for Hessenberg varieties. So without saying more about why, I'm just gonna like actually show you what the graphs are uh, for the regular semi-simple varieties. Uh, so, Here's my sort of flag variety graph, and let me try this. Gonna paste a couple more copies in here. smaller and smaller copies in here. All right, so uh, so my Hessenberg variety comes with a function. So I'm gonna give you almost every function uh, almost every function for uh, n equals three. All right, so the thing on the far left, the full flag variety, that is a Hessenberg branch variety. It corresponds to the function h of i equals three, um, which is determined by h of one equals three. The thing on the right, 
I'm going to. So all, all of these regular semi simple Hessenberg varieties have the same. Uh, so they actually all have the same fixed points. Every permutation works. Um, but if I make the Hessenberg function as small as possible, I erase all of those edges um, everywhere in the graph. Uh, if I allow myself a little bit of wiggle around H1, then I'm also going to be erasing edges. Uh, this time, I erase almost all the edges. Um, now, if I take this function h of 1 equals 2, h of 2 equals 3, uh, h of 3 equals 3, I'm just erasing the middle edges. And then finally, on the left, I have all of the edges that I started with. So sort of if you think of it as moving from the full flag variety to the right, every time you take a step to the right, you erase uh, precisely one green, one red, one blue edge. Um, it's actually determined exactly by the conditions of the Hessenberg uh, function. Um, and it's determined by uh, which, which reflections you are right multiplying by. So right multiplication determines which edges uh, you remove uh, to get uh, your uh, regular semi-simple Hessenberg uh, varieties. Um, and just uh, not that I'm going to be saying anything about this really, but just very quickly, I can, yeah, just very quickly, it, I take it back. I will not say anything about the uh, permutation action, um, except to observe that since all of my vertices of the graph are permutations, um, since I have what at least visibly we can see is a sort of very symmetric conditions on the edges, um, you can actually permute the classes, the uh, equivariant classes in certain ways. Um, and get other equivariant classes. So it's like super combinatorial, really just based on the graph. And, ha, great. And that's time for the break. Oh, uh, wait, I just think, let me actually just say, so, so, so this is the question that we'll leave for the breaks. Which other Hessenberg varieties are GKM? Great. Um, 